what to do when faith seems weak and victory loss. And uh, again, our, our first few points have been recognize the source of your problem, which is the devil. Je Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come to give life and to give it more abundantly. Your answer comes from God. So the devil's the problem. Je God's the answer. That's always the way it is. Uh, second, be sure the promises of God cover the things you ask for. And you're not going to have faith unless you're believing what the Bible says. If you don't, if you don't, have, if you don't have Scripture to cover what you're believing for, it's not faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And then we got into uh, be sure you're not living in sin. That's a, that's a no-brainer. Um, you know, John wrote to the church and said in his first book of John, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. Sin brings your own heart into condemnation. And if you have confidence toward God, that means you don't have any sin in your life, then you have boldness toward God. Then we talked about last week how to be sure there's no doubt or unbelief in permitted in your life. And uh, this morning we talked about sincerely desiring the benefit. You got to have a sincere desire for the things of God, uh, uh, as uh, Second Timothy says, unfeigned faith, which means the word unfeigned means sincere. So tonight, let's get into uh, the next point: ask God in faith, nothing wavering. Ask God in faith, nothing wavering. Go, if you will, to the James, the first chapter of the sixth verse. I actually, probably ought to back up there just a little bit, um, where James says uh, there in chapter one, I believe, verse five. I didn't put that in my, on my iPad, so now I've got to use the, the uh, paper Bible. I love, I love my Bible, but I, this is so cool. Hallelujah. Um, verse 5 says, if any of you lack wisdom, anybody ever been in a place you, didn't, you lacked wisdom? Three of you. All right, rest of you probably will get there eventually. Let him ask of God, hallelujah, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. Listen to verse 6. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering. Uh, you know, because he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. In other words, you have to have a steadfast, unwavering faith if you're going to get answers. If you waver, you know, I mean, no, you, you, know, you can't waver. How, you know, the Old Testament has Christ said, how long uh, you, do you uh, waver between two opinions or halt between two opinions? You know, you're wavering. You're not steadfast. We know that something isn't anchored, if it isn't steadfast, if it isn't locked in and anchored in something, it will fall over. And your faith will fail if you waver. Scripture says, let him ask faith, nothing wavering, because he that wavers is like the wind of the sea, tossed, like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Meaning you're, one minute you're believing, next minute I don't know. One minute you're going, yeah, I got it. Next minute you're going, I sure hope so. Now, how many, how many understand that the term I hope so is not a statement of faith? It's a wish. It's a wish. It really is. <clears throat> you know, where you, believe, you believe God's going to do what he, you ask, his word says to do. I sure hope so. Well, what you're really saying is, I really don't think he will. I'm not sure. No, you're not. See, the Bible talked about Abraham being fully persuaded in Romans chapter 4. It said Abraham being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. See, that's faith. Faith is fully persuaded. Remember when Paul preached to the, to the, uh, <clears throat> the guy and he said, almost. Thou persuadest me to be a Christian. That wasn't good enough. Almost wasn't good enough. You mean when you're almost persuaded, that means you're not fully persuaded. The Bible says Abraham was fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to perform. And see, a, a fully persuaded faith is a non-wavering faith. When you're fully persuaded that what God said he's going to do, he's going to do, you'll take him at his word, you'll act on his word, and you'll live according to his word. Now, I've been in church services where somebody has said, you know, um, you know, evangelicals, we evangelicals like to give altar calls. <clears throat> and you know, say, well, come on down tonight. You never know God might save you. And I'm going to tell you something. There's no basis for faith there. You never know God might. And if anybody comes, they're hoping. Maybe this is the night. But if I preach to you, that the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that today is the day of salvation. If you harden not your heart and turn yourself to God, then he'll answer you. You know, then I say, listen, the, every day is a day of salvation. All you got to do is accept Jesus Christ right now. You say that, then you get somebody a, a, an ability to have a full persuasion and not a partial or almost persuasion. And you see, the same thing comes in um, when, we, when we teach on salvation, people getting saved. But you know, the Hebrew and the Greek words, both um, the, uh, the Hebrew version and the Greek version of the word salvation. Now, in Greek, it's sozo. We have what we call the sozo word group. And uh, that, that covers soterius, which is the noun, sozo, which is the verb. And it means, you know, the noun or the verb means to save, 
to heal, to make whole, to deliver. And uh, when, we, when we teach things to people, you'll teach people, you know, we'll have people come and teach salvation, getting saved. God will save you no matter what you've done. Da, 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 and people will respond. Then you come right back and they'll go, hey, you just never know if God will heal you or not. Well, the same word means, the, same, the word is used in, in both places, same Greek word. You've you got to preach it with the same authority and the same assurance that if they'll act in faith, they can get the answer. Now, I love Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. Now, I heard a preacher on television one year. He's sitting in on one of these talk show kind of things, and, boy, he preached salvation off of that. Boy, I don't care if you're a prostitute. I don't care if you're a drug dealer. I don't care if you've murdered somebody. God says he'll forgive all your iniquities. And, man, their phone banks lit up. People were calling in, praying with the prayer counselors, giving their life to Jesus. And then all of a sudden he says, now, and after about 10 minutes of that, he looks over at the host and goes, you know, now the last half of that says who heals all your diseases. And then looked at the camera and said, now all don't always mean all. And I sat there dumbfounded. <clears throat> How can you preach with such authority that he forgives all your iniquities and then because there's a little semicolon there, he doesn't heal all your diseases? Now, they did not have the same response when they said, if you need healing, call. Why? Because he did not give them the word of God that gave them the full assurance that they could be fully persuaded that God would. Because then they, they go to, well, you just never know. God may be doing that for a reason. Well, God ain't keeping you unsaved for a reason. God's not making you, you know, sin for a reason. You know? Well, I'm not going to save you. You're going to be a prostitute, you know, and uh, we'll, you'll figure out why one day. No! God, God hates sin. God hates sickness. How do you know? Well, I, I, when I read the scriptures, I found out from 1 Peter 2, 24, Isaiah 53, uh, Psalm 103, that Jesus took our sin and our sicknesses. He hates both of them. He used the same sacrifice to bring the solution to humanity through Jesus Christ. So, salva so and, and then even the words in the Greek words, like I said, salvation and healing mean the same thing. In the Old and New Testament, the, the Hebrew equivalent of sozo means the exact same thing. In, in, the, in, the, in the original languages. God, see, now this, this is what we're coming to. We have to ask in faith, nothing waver. Well, how, how am I going to get to the place I don't waver? You're going to have a steadfast assurance and a trust that God's word is true. Now, we don't need a guy with a Ph.D. or an M.A., a B.A. I, I've got my M.A. and I've got my Ph.D. A.B.D., all right, which means your, your, your uh, philosophy doctorate without uh, all but dissertation. I've, I haven't written the paper yet. Hallelujah. I'm just, I just, you know, I just feel like writing 150 pages. Anyway, <laughs> you know how that is. You know, some people love to write 150 pages. I don't. Uh, uh, me and my son. Hallelujah. You know, getting him to write a paper is like, you know, uh, cattle prodding a cow with that, that thing. I think I'm going to buy one just so I can get him to do it. So, <clears throat> understand your faith can't waver. It has to be assurance. It has to be steadfast. You have to, you have to get after it and not let go of it. Romans chapter 4, verse 16 through 22. Therefore it is of faith that it might be grace by grace to the end of the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which also is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Now, I love the Weymouth translation of that particular phrase, uh, that phrase which says he calls things which be not as though they were. The Weymouth translation says this, who makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. I like that. Calls those things which be not as though they were, makes reference to things that do not exist as though they did. That should help you. I like it. Amen. All right. I just opened up, his eye for me, opened up my eyes for me. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations. Now, one translation says this, that when there was no hope, he still hoped, had hope. That, 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 that God's word is true. Amen? Hallelujah. So he said here, against, so against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. According to what? That which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, which was about 100 years old. Uh, wow. And neither dead, the deadness of Sarah's womb, she was 90. He staggered not. 
Staggering or wavering? About the same thing here. At the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, Abraham uh, was 75 years old when God first spoke to him about being the father of many nations. Okay? At 75 years old, he said, your, sand to be, your sea to be as the sand of the seashore and as the stars of the heaven. That's pretty old. And Sarah was 65. <clears throat> That's pretty old. Anybody checked? Anybody ever seen any, uh, been to the uh, OBGYN doctor lately and seen 65-year-old women sitting in there pregnant? No? Well, God waited another 25 years. Hello? Now, can you imagine some 100-year-old man and 90-year-old woman come walking in and going and saying, where's, where's the, the Greensboro OBGYN? And you're looking at them going, you're looking for the long office like the geriatric wards down there. Okay? I mean, yo, you're talking 190. No, 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 no. She's pregnant. Now, today, we could probably blame it off on some type of, you know, some crazy person trying to come and get in the Guinness Book of World Record through, uh, through artificial insemination. But I'm going to tell you, that ain't what happened here. God gave a word. And then, remember, at, 20, at 75, he gave him a word that he would be the sand of the seashores and the stars of the heaven. At 87, Abraham came to God and said, hey, look, this ain't working. Can, you know, um, and Hagar said, I mean, not Hagar, but, but Sarah said, go into, my, go into my handmaiden Hagar. Abraham said, okay. He didn't argue one bit. Did y'all you know, notice that? There was no argument on his part. He went into handmaiden, got her pregnant. He, she had Ishmael. You don't want Ishmael's. Ishmael's are not the promise of God. And then when Abraham was 99, God showed up again and said, you know, I'm going to do that. He said, he said Abraham said this, oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. He said, okay, I'm going to bless Ishmael, but that's not the promise. I, and I'm going to kind of just give Ed Taylor a paraphrase here. My promise is supernatural. My promise cannot be done by the hands of man's plans. It's going to be a supernatural promise and a supernatural result that no man can claim the glory for. Amen? And so Sarah got pregnant at 90. Woo! How many of you women want to have a baby at 90? Some of you think, I'm, sick, I, I'm 40, I'm done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Here comes 90-year-old, here comes Isaac, baby bouncing boy Isaac. At 90, when, by the time she was 91, this time next year, so a year later, you know, so a year later she comes up, she's pregnant. Now God told Abram, at that time he was still Abram, she was still Sarah, and at that time he said, no longer shall you be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. And change Sarah's name to, from Sarah to Sarah, meaning the mother of many nations. Why? It was, uh, can you imagine him showing up at the city gate and saying, guys, don't call me Abram anymore. Call me, and see, so you understand, in, in, in that era, our, our day doesn't have as much significance with it, but in their day, names meant a lot. And he said, you're going to start calling me Abraham. They knew what that meant, the father of many nations. I got to think some 20-year-old guys were just rolling on the floor, laughing. If they'd been on Facebook, they'd have been posting stuff, you know, uh, R -L, R -F -L, rolling on the floor, laughing, and all that kind of stuff. Abe just showed up and said he's changed his name. <coughs> 99 years old, and he's changed it to the father of many nations. Why? Because God wanted him to, what, wanted to have a reinforcement that every time he heard his name called, he was hearing the promise of God that was going to be fulfilled in him to become the father of many nations. Amen. See, we're to meditate in his word day and night. Joshua 1 this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then shalt shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. See, the Bible says if you'll meditate in the word, and do and observe to do then you're going to have prosperity and good success that phrase good success the hebrew means deal wisely in the affairs of life abram went from being abram you know the hundred year old dude who wanted uh, whose wife wanted the baby to call ever having ever call him abraham and sarah the father and the mother of many nations and then a year later here comes isaac and you can laugh all you want to the people who take a hold of the Word of God and start believing God's Word. But you know what it says here? He did that according as it was spoken to him. So shall thy seed be. God took that Word. And then, you know, if you kind of take Abraham's life 
and go study the time when God spoke to him and says, take your son, your only son, and go into a place I will show thee. And he gets there, and he, and he tells his crew, he says, stop here, me and the lad are going to go worship the Lord and come again to you. But God said to go offer him. And he's got, he told everybody that came with him, I and the lad are going to go yonder and worship the Lord and come again unto you. But God had already told him, you go offer your son as a sacrifice. And when you read the New Testament, it says this, that, that Abraham had received Isaac raised from the dead in a figure. He was going to offer him on that altar and burn him, but God said he was the seed. God was going to have to take those ashes and raise him from the dead. Abraham, see, Abraham was so persuaded. When you get, it, it doesn't matter, when you get so persuaded with the Word of God, what God's Word says, and you've got that unwavering faith, you can offer whatever it is that you have to God and burn it on the altar, and God will take the ashes and raise it back up and make it alive to you again. Amen. And Abraham had drawn the knife back and was about to slay his son on that altar when the angel of the Lord called out of heaven and said, Stop. Amen. And that, that's where that name came from, Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will make provision. That came from that, that event. The Lord will, remember, uh, the Lord will provide himself a ram. And that place is called Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will make provision. God made provision. Amen. Or you're in the thicket and there was a ram there. Because you withheld not your son, you're your only son. And then God made a promise, covenant promise to be the provider. Amen. See, when you have unwavering faith, it, no matter what the circumstances say, no matter how the circumstances are arrayed against you. And you've got to think, when, 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 if you've got a word for the Lord that said you're going to have a baby and you're 100 years old and your wife's 90, you've got to think, boy, you better know it's God. Hello. And he took that word. And he became steadfast with that word. And God brought forth Isaac out of a promise to a man and a woman who were 190 years old and fulfilled his word in them because they had being fully persuaded that what he had spoken, he was able to perform. That's faith. Amen? Some people get a headache and they go, oh God, I can't get, a, I can't get healed. Well, you're going to have to get some unwavering faith over stuff bigger than headaches. Amen? The life of faith is bigger than small stuff. Hallelujah. So we have, we have to get back there asking God nothing wavering. Um, 1 Timothy 2 8 says this, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Hebrews 6 6. <laughs> Y'all know this one, don't you? Hebrews 11 6. I'm sorry, Hebrews 11 6. But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I believe if we'll learn to come to the place where we know that God will do exactly what he said he'll do. You know, people make these statements a lot of times. And, and, and they're statements that the church, we, we, no, we're, we're people. How many, how many know you, you can pick up and start saying stuff that other people said and you don't know it for a fact? No, nah, let me, I guess I, it's going to snow tomorrow. I just heard it's going to snow tomorrow. Now, there'll be people walk out of this room and go tell people, hey, you know it's going to snow tomorrow? I won't even check the weather forecast. They do it all the time. Are y'all here? Yeah, you know, well, Pastor Ed said it. It's gonna, they're going to snow. It's going to snow. Amen. And then you look at the weather forecast, it's going to be 70. Well, where, well I, I don't know. I just heard somebody else say it, so I just told you that somebody else said it. We have a habit of repeating things without finding out for sure for ourselves. Okay? And there are people who come along and tell us that, you know, uh, God don't, doesn't do that anymore, or God doesn't do this, or whatever, but they don't ever go to the Bible to find out what God said. They don't look into the Scriptures to see what the Word says. Hello? You know? They'll, they'll take, you know, take somebody's word for it. Well, you know what? Uh, I, I'm glad that you may have confidence in a person, but you know, I'll tell you what, uh, confidence in a person doesn't produce faith. Confidence in what God said produces faith. And so you've got to go to the Bible and find out what the Bible says for yourself. Now, I've, I've seen prophecy preachers, you know, back in 1988. How many remember that? Some of y'all, everybody was born in 1988, except for the little guys in here. There's a guy who wrote a book. And, and there's a Hebrew feast in the month of September, somewhere usually around September 7th, 8th, and 9th, called Rosh Hashanah. Okay? And uh, this guy wrote a book. And he had this book called 88 Reasons Jesus is Coming Back 
And it was during Rosh Hashanah, I believe it was September 7th, 8th, or 9th, or 8th, 9th, or 10th. I don't remember how it fell that year. 1988. He had 88 reasons. People started selling their homes. People started doing all this kind of they, they forgot to read the scripture that no man knows the hour that Jesus is coming back. You know, just read the Bible, you'll stay out of trouble, you know. <clears throat> he was going around churches and preaching, and they were having him in there, and they were all getting all up. Woo, the Lord's coming back. Going on some hilltop somewhere waiting. Seven, eight, nine. You got to imagine that when midnight of the, of the, of the last day of Rosh Hashanah hit, and, and they're still here, they were disappointed. But no! <laughs> he wrote another book. 89 reasons Jesus is coming back in Rosh Hashanah 1989. Now, I'm going to tell you that. I'm not joking. All the 88 reasons for the previous year, plus reason 89, he didn't come back at 88. I'm not joking. People bought the book and did the same thing. It's just like this guy, <coughs> was it last year that he supposed, Jesus was supposed to come back in March? According to this guy who's supposed to be, you know, he had prophesied that about 15 years before. Quote prophesied, that's, you know. How, how do you know it, it wasn't prophecy? It didn't happen. That one's easy to judge. Was that the Lord or not? Oh, I don't know. We're still here. <laughs> I mean, you know what I'm saying? Well, it didn't happen. You know what he does? Oh, I, I miscalculated. He's coming back in November. Now, some of the, some of the uh, Jim Jones Kool-Aid drinkers stayed with him until November. Now, it was the third time he missed it. I think 90% of them finally figured out he didn't know what he's talking about. Now, I said all this to say something. If you take somebody else's word and don't search the scriptures yourself, you can get messed up. We know from scripture that the return of, we can see signs of the time. We can see events taking place that will point to the imminent return of the Lord, but no man knows the day or the hour. No man. So if somebody tells you, I know what time Jesus is coming back, run! Because they don't know what they're talking about. Amen? Fine. Now, that's just something like that. That's, that's just really, we call it an extreme thing. But what if people come along and say, well, you know, God, God doesn't heal people anymore, or God doesn't do this anymore. Well, why don't you go find what the Bible says? Hello? Amen? I, I, I found it really interesting. Now, um, there, was a, there was a Bible, there was a few Bible schools in the country, but they, they, uh, they actually put in on their websites and put in their literature. It says, if you speak in tongues, don't, you're, you're, this is the wrong Bible school. We don't permit that here. Yet we've got a, a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 that says, forbid no man to speak in tongues. Now, whether you think it's cool or not, whether you like it or not, or whether it upsets you or not, the fact is you better not be forbidding it because you've got scripture that says, forbid no man. Hello? See, we, we need to get back to the Bible. Now, here's what happens when you go to the Bible. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When you forget what man says. And we, listen, preachers were designed to point you in a direction. We're not to be your, your, be your God. We're not your go-between. You know, the, the, the priesthood where the priest was the go-between between man and God ended when the veil of the temple was rent in two. Ministers now preach the word, teach the word, but we're not your go-between anymore that, that that whole type of priesthood ended it is god said i will write my laws in their hearts and in their minds and i will be their god and they'll be my people jesus did not say when ye pray go to the priest he said our father when he taught the disciples remember the disciples came and said john teaches his disciples how to pray teach us how to pray and he said you pray like this our father which art in heaven in other words, you have a personal relationship with him, no longer as just God, but as your father. Amen? And so now, you know, I, I am to point you in a direction, but I'm not your answer. The word of God your answer. Jesus is your intercessor. Amen? That's what the scripture says. Where he, he's, he's seated in the heavenly places where he ever lives to make intercession for us. So, when you go to the word of God, and you see what the scripture says, and you embrace that in faith, and you get to the place you're steadfast like Abraham was. I don't think any of you faced a 100-year-old event. Some of you think, man, if I could just run around the block at 100, that'd be doing good. Abraham's having children. You better be able to run around the block. <laughs> Amen. Good gracious. You know, and especially if you're like Shannon, not Shannon, but Jesse was. Jesse was our wild child. She'd come in, she'd be on the refrigerator. She had, we had everything locked, cabinets, cabinet drawers, door locks. I mean, we had to lock everything to keep her out of it. Shannon would just go in a corner and go to sleep. 
you know? And we don't know. We haven't figured anything out yet. He's kind of in between there somewhere. But without faith, it's impossible to please God. That means you can't waver in your faith. You've got to believe that he is, and he's a rewarder. Now, when you lay hold of the promise of God and faith, you cannot waver. But if, and if you don't waver, you'll get the answer. I said you'll get the answer. So if, you're, if your faith seems weak and your victory seems lost, check up in your life and see if you're wavering in your faith walk. See if you're looking at things and going, you know, yeah, the Bible says that, but. I'll tell you what, watch out for the buts. Amen? Now, the, the old saying is this, sheep say yes and goats but. Amen? Don't be a goat, be a sheep. Goats are always butting things. They're always wanting to be contrary. They're always wanting to go against. They're always wanting to be hard-headed. That's why they, got, they, they are hard-headed. They always want to have a button there somewhere. Yeah, I know the Bible says that, but. No, 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 the Bible says that. Yeah, I know the Bible says that, but my, I don't care what your pastor says. I don't care what I say. If what I says does not line up with what the Word says, then what I say is wrong. And you've got to be smart enough to spend time in the Word to find out for yourself. Can you say amen, somebody? Amen. So what we're going to do, we're going to be steadfast in faith. We're not going to waver. We're going to take God's word just like Abraham. We're going to be fully persuaded that what he promised, he's able to perform. Now that means you, listen. Now I, my son's got to go home tonight and study all the muscle groups of the body and be able to spell them for P.E. tomorrow. Woo! Thrill, thrill. I'm like, why? I mean, I'm, 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 I kind of go, Why? You know, you know, but it's college. He's got to study. He knows what he's got to do. But if he doesn't apply himself, she needs to send out an email. I'm taking off my spelling. <laughs> and you don't get to use your spell checker. Hallelujah. You got to be able to spell it. If he doesn't apply himself, he's not going to do good. I've told you what's required, but if you don't apply yourself, it won't work. You've got to get into the Word. You've got to feed on the word. You've got to become fully persuaded of what God promised he's able to perform. And then you step out in faith and don't waver. You hold fast. He Hebrews chapter 11, 10 says, hold fast your profession of faith. Why? Anybody remember what it says? Because he is faithful that promised. <music>